Hi everyone. My name is uh, Luke and I'm a compiler engineer at Agalia and I work on the RISC-V backend. And in particular, I've been focusing on the vector side of things for the past while. So today I want to talk to you about how we generate code for the RISC-V vector extension. And the RISC-V vector extension is pretty unique in comparison to other vector ICEs. So I'll start off by giving a brief kind of whirlwind tour of some of its features. We'll then take a look at how we can represent some of those semantics in LVMIR. Um, we'll also take a look at um, how we actually generate the code for it. That's like the name of the talk. So it'd be remiss not to mention that. And then of course, it'd be fun to talk about some of the cool things that we can do in the middle end optimization passes that take advantage of some of the features of this ISA. So I'd like to begin anyway by talking about a simpler ISA, uh, ARM Neon. And this was back to simpler times whenever we had fixed length vector registers. So on ARM Neon, the vector registers are always 128 bits in size, and this is great. Because if you're the loop vectorizer, you can just emit a vector of like four 32-bit integers, and you know it's always going to exactly fit into that vector register. But ARM SVE came along, and this is the scalable vector extension for ARM. And it introduced this notion of scalable vector registers where we no longer know exactly what the size of the vector register is going to be at compile time. So they can be anything from 128 bits to 1024 bits in size, depending on the microarchitecture. And you're not going to know this until you actually run your code. And the code that you write for ARM SVE is actually agnostic to this vector length. So the single add instruction on one micro architecture, it might execute across four elements, but you could take that exact same instruction and run it on a different machine. And you might find that it's now operating on eight elements if the vector size was doubled, right? So whenever SVE support was first added in LLVM, we needed some sort of way to represent this notion of a scalable vector type, a vector where we don't know the exact number of elements in it, but we know that there's going to be some minimum and it's going to vary at runtime. So scalable vectors were introduced and they look like this, right? It'll look like vscale times some minimum number of elements times the element type. And this vscale, it's a constant that it's unknown at compile time, but it will resolve something at runtime and that will be a constant, but it's gonna be some sort of factor dependent on typically the size of the vector register. And on ARM SVE, this is the register size in bits divided by 128 bits. And that brings us to the RISC-V vector extension because it's pretty similar to ARM SVE. It also has scalable vectors as well, and they can be anything from 32 bits all the way up to like 64 kilobits in size. They can be really, really big. And although in theory, the theoretical minimum size of a vector register according to the specification is 32 bits, in LLVM, the minimum size that we support is 64 bits. I believe this is just out of pragmatism more than anything else. So we define vScale on RVV as the size of the vector register in bits, which we call VLAN, divided by 64. So what does it look like anyway? It looks something like this, right? We can write scalable vector LVMIR and it will get lowered into our little vAd.vv instruction. So you can read that as vector add with .vv meaning two vector operands. And it looks pretty innocuous at first, but if you compare this to ARM SVE, one of the first things that you notice with the ISA is that ARM SVE has these .s suffixes on its operands. And that .s stands for single word. And that tells ARM to treat this vector as a vector of single word elements or 32-bit elements. But we don't have that on RVV. We don't have anything inside the actual instruction itself that says operate on 32-bit elements or operate on 64-bit elements, right? So where do we actually encode this? Because of encoding constraints, this is actually encoded in a separate register called vType. And we have to manually set this vType register with this vset VLI instruction. We call the element width or the selected element width SEW. Um, that's the size of the element. And yeah, we'll set it with this vset VLI instruction, which is like pervasive everywhere. You will see this all about the place. But you can see that there's a bunch of other operands as well in this vset VLI instruction. And they allow us to control all these different configurations that we can do on RVV and use and configure some of its features. One of the most important features is this notion of vector length or this VL register. And what this VL register allows us to do is it allows us to 
control the number of elements that we operate on by predicating the first n elements. So for example, if we set this VL register to five, then we'll only operate on the first five elements of the vector register. And again, we configure this with VSAT VLI. We also have the ability to perform predicated execution. This kind of works how you'd expect. You can specify a mask register that has to be in the V0 vector register, and then it will enable or disable different lanes. And this will intersect with the vector length register predication. But perhaps the most interesting feature of RVV is this notion of register grouping. And it allows us to essentially sacrifice the number of vector registers that we have in order to increase the size of the vector registers. So again, it's something that we configure with VSAT VLI, and it's stored in the V-type register, and we call this multiplier, this length multiplier, ELMOL. And what this ELMOL multiplier does is that if we were to change it to two, all of a sudden V0 becomes V0 and V1 grouped together, V2 becomes V2 and V3 grouped together, and so on and so forth. But that means we have half the number of vector registers available now, but we now have double the size of the vector registers. And that means we can either process double the number of elements in a single instruction, or it means that we can operate on an element of double the width, right? So it's very useful for fixed width, uh, sorry, mixed width arithmetic. And it's important to note that this doesn't actually like magically increase throughput or whatever. It will take more cycles to process in a single instruction, but it's still a very useful feature to have anyway. So now that we've seen some of these features of RVV, we can start to ask, well, <coughs> How do we control them? So you saw in the first example, we have this plain old um, LVM iron instruction that performs an add. And the only thing we can control here is the element width that's just encoded in the type there, like I32. If we want to control any of the fun stuff, what we have to do instead is use one of two types of intrinsics. We can either use the RVV intrinsics, which are more or less a mapping one-to-one -one of the underlying vector instructions in the RISC-V ISA. Um, these contain operands for all the things that you'd want to toggle, like the mask, the vector length, um, some other things as well, like policy bits. The other way that we can express and control these features is through the vector predication intrinsics. And some of you might already know what these are, but just as a recap, these are kind of like a copy of existing LVM instructions and intrinsics that operate on vectors, but the main difference is that they now have a mask operand and a vector length operand. But the great thing about vector predication intrinsics is that they're target agnostic, so we can actually use them in some of the middle end optimization passes later, where we can't just be introducing you know, target specific intrinsics like the one above. So yeah, you might have noticed that there's no operand in any of these intrinsics for ELMO for register grouping. And the reason for that is because we actually encode the notion of register grouping and ELMO inside the actual vector type itself. And specifically, we encode it in the size of the scalable vector type. So if we remember back to our definition of what vSkill is on LVM, it's the size of the vector register in bits divided by 64. So if we have a scalable vector type like vSkill times two times I32, that's going to exactly fit into one vector register. But what if we were to create a type that was like vSkill times four times I32? Well that's going to take at least two vector registers to fit. So naturally, we just map that to LML equals two. We'll start grouping the registers together, and then so on and so forth. We can just keep on using larger LMLs if we just increase the size of the vector type. So now that we've seen how we can kind of control some of these features of RVV from LVMR IR, we can start to talk about how we're actually going to generate code for it. So we'll start from an LVM IR instruction, and we'll have to think of a way to get it down to machine code. And the first step in that is that, well, we build a selection DAG for now. Maybe global ISL will change things, but we have some sort of node, and we need to select some instruction. We need to perform instruction selection. But we can't just select a VAD here, right? Because VAD on its own doesn't have all the necessary information to carry out the semantics, right? We need to perform a VSAT VLI to set up the VL register and the VType register correctly. So what we do instead is that we select a pseudo instruction and we have lots and lots of these pseudo instructions. These basically copy one-to-one -one all the underlying uh, vector instructions that we have in the RISC-V ISA and we have like variants for all the different types of ELMO. We have variants for whether or not they have a mask or not. There's like a dizzying number of them. 
But the key takeaway here is that these will contain all the operands needed to preserve the semantics of this instruction. We then have a separate pass called the RISC-V insert VSAT VLI pass, which will insert the VSAT VLI instructions. It will take these um, pseudo instructions and then it will like expand them out into the necessary VSAT VLI and underlying vector instruction. But you might be wondering why do we bother with the pseudo instruction to begin with? Why don't we just like select a VSAT VLI and a VAD instruction here in this case? And the reason is because if you look at a typical sequence of vector code, the element width and the vector length and the ELMO for register grouping, it doesn't actually really change that much throughout a sequence of instructions. So we don't actually need to emit a VSAT VLI every single time. And by using pseudo instructions, we can defer inserting these VSAT VLI instructions until later. And we do so in a conservative manner so that we only emit them where they're actually needed. And the RISC-V insert VSAT VLI pass is very good at this. It can like keep track of like whenever VL needs to change, whenever V type needs to change, and it will do so quite efficiently. So hopefully that'll give you an idea of how we kind of start from LVM IR and how we work our way down to preserving the semantics at the machine code level. Um, we can start to talk about how you know, this vectorized LVM IR will actually get introduced in the process because I mean, you can write vectorized LVM IR by hand, but most of the time, or hopefully most of the time, it'll be introduced by some sort of auto vectorizer. And we have two main ones in LVM. Uh, one of them is the SLP vectorizer. This is our super word level parallelism vectorizer. And just as a recap, it takes straight line scalar code and vectorizes it. So it doesn't operate on loops. And yeah, if you notice in this example here where we're scalar or vectorizing these two scalar stores that are beside each other, the SLP vectorizer emits a fixed length vector, right? It's not scalable. And this entire talk, we've just been talking about scalable vectors because the vectors in RISC-V are scalable, but we do support emitting code for fixed length vectors. And the lowdown on how we do it is basically that we take our fixed length vector and we will put it inside some sort of scalable container type. Now, one of the few things that we're lucky enough to know in RVV is we will know the minimum size of a vector register. So with that, we can choose an appropriate ELMO, which will be guaranteed to be able to fit our fixed length vector type. And so we will place it in that and then we will legalize whatever operation to operate on a VL node. And these VL nodes are like duplicates of the generic um, selection diagnodes, but they'll all contain a VL operand. This VL operand allows us to specify something that will get lowered into the VL operand of the pseudo, which allows us to control our vector length. And we just pass in the length of the fixed length vector. And so that allows us to kind of emulate fixed length vector semantics, if you will. So, that's great. We can generate code that SLP produces, but if you kind of look at what this will actually get lowered to, on our left, our scalar stores only took three instructions, but whenever we performed SLP vectorization on it, it now became four instructions, right? This is actually a non-profitable transform. And we were seeing lots of these little unprofitable transforms where SLP was taking small sequences of scalar instructions and then you know, doing some sort of vectorization that was actually more expensive in the end. And you know, you might kind of ask yourself, well, why was this happening? And the ugly, honest answer is just that some things are more expensive on RVV than other targets, right? One of the first things that you might notice is that, well, we don't have any addressing modes for any of the vector loads and store instructions. So what was previously folded into the addressing mode in the scalar version now requires an extra add instruction to compute this offset. And that wasn't cost modeled for. Another thing that we don't cost model for is the VSAT VLI instructions. These are pretty non-trivial to kind of predict whenever they're going to be emitted because the logic behind emitting them is quite complicated and they have no represent or representation at the LVM IR level. And there's a bunch of other things like vector inserts and extracts, right? These are really commonly emitted by SLP. It loves to emit them and they're very, very expensive at higher LMOs on RVV. And because these inserts and extracts can be expensive, it means that constant materialization of vectors can also be very expensive. So we had to do a bunch of work to improve the cost model. We made the expensive things more expensive and we improved how we performed constant materialization. And now that SLP is overall profitable, um, it is now enabled by default on LVM 17. So 
The other type of auto vectorization that we have in LVM is the loop vectorizer, of course. And traditionally, as I'm sure everyone or a lot of people in this room would know that the loop vectorizer chooses some sort of like vectorization factor, which is, you know, in previous simpler times, it was like a fixed number. So we just emit a fixed length vector, but we have had support for vectorizing with scalable vectors since LVM 16, I believe. And this is now enabled by default, which is great because it means that whenever we go to vectorize the loop, we will now use the entire vector register available on the microarchitecture, which is great. Um, and you can see there, we only emit the one VSET VLI instruction, right? Because we're clever about it. We don't need to emit it for every single instruction. And you can also see how in this VSET VLI instruction, we set ML to two. Um, this is just a static default that is chosen. It's not very smart about it and it doesn't change dynamically on any sort of like condition. We set ML to two by default because whenever we increase ML, we increase the number of elements that we can operate on in a single instruction, which means that we can perform and execute more. We can process more elements in a single iteration, which reduces the overhead of the control flow instructions in the loop. And what we'd really like to be able to do is to increase ML dynamically and choose a higher ML where, wherever possible, wherever profitable. The issue is that whenever we increase ML, we also reduce the number of vector registers available. So if we increase it too much, we can end up like negatively affecting register pressure. So this would be something that would be great to teach the loop vectorizer about, but we do need to keep in mind that we would also have to start reasoning about register pressure when choosing an ELMO. And you can see at the bottom that we also have a scalar epilogue. And we need the scalar epilogue because we'll need it to mop up any remainder elements in an iteration that aren't evenly divisible by the vector length. So for example, if the vector length is some multiple of four and we have like six elements to process, we'll need this scalar loop at the end to process the remaining two iterations. And you can see that it's quite a big chunk of the vectorized loop. So it might be desirable to get rid of it. And one way that we can do that today in LVM is with this prefer predicate over epilogue flag. We can perform tail folding as it's called and move the tail into the vector body by masking the, uh, the vector loads in store so that they won't trap on these remainder iterations. And you can see here how we have to perform this mass computation uh, in the loop. Unfortunately, Whilst this is good for code size, it does increase the amount of work that we perform inside the vectorized loop. So it can be negative for throughput. What we really want to be able to do on RVV is that we want to be able to control and perform tail folding with the VL register because that's pretty much exactly what it's designed for, right? It allows us to produce very, very uh, like small and efficient, uh, you know, strip mined loops. And the great thing about it is that because the VL register is just an integer, we can almost always directly connect that to some sort of induction variable. And there will always be an induction variable anyway in the loop because we'll be counting down the number of iterations. And then whenever we get to the last iteration of the loop, if we just connect that induction variable to the vector length register, then we're automatically just going to predicate off any elements that we don't want trapping. So. This isn't in main today, but there is a very long running patch, which is, um, which is looking to add initial support for it. And that's a good place where we can use VP intrinsics, right? Because we need some sort of way of controlling the vector length register from a target agnostic optimization. So that's just um, one of the areas of LVM where we're continuing to add and add support for new or RVV features and to improve how we get the most out of RVV. But there's lots of other areas here uh, that we could take advantage of. So as we're going to be using vector predication intrinsics more and more, we'll probably need to start improving support for them, right? Vector predication intrinsics are still relatively new and there's a lot of missing optimizations and combines that would be great to have so that we can bring them on par with their non-predicated uh, equivalents. We have Lots of instructions in RVV to perform particular types of uh, memory accesses like interleaved loads and stores. Um, it would be great to get better support for them at higher group levels. And yeah, we have instructions for data dependent loop exits. Like there's lots of stuff that we could be supporting here, but 
RVV in LVM is under very active development at the moment, and there's lots of people working on it on many different areas of it. So uh, big thanks to everyone who has been working on all this stuff. Most of the stuff that I have shown is not my work. So um, thanks to everyone that's been working on it. And yeah, hopefully you will have a better idea now of how exactly we generate code for RVV. Thanks. Thank you, Luke. Uh, any questions? Please use the mics for the questions. Hey, uh, great presentation. I'm wondering how expensive is to be changing the vector length uh, so frequently? Because in one of the examples, mm -hmm. uh, you have even two instances of that uh, in the loop body. So. Yeah. So from what I understand, and I guess this is going to be microarchitecture dependent, but V-type toggles tend to be a bit cheaper than VL toggles. We should probably ask some of the more hardware focused people about this, but it is something that we do try to avoid toggling. Like we do have a lot of work um, in, done in the RISC-V insert VSAT VLI vector pass to actually avoid changing VL wherever possible. Like sometimes we will actually increase VL so that we're operating on more elements just so that we can eliminate a VSAT VLI toggle. But yeah, it will be kind of microarchitecture dependent. And even in like selection diag, whenever we're legalizing elements and performing instruction selection, we'll sometimes select specific patterns or explicitly pass in the vector length ahead of time in case we know that it's going to prevent a toggle. But yeah, it is something that you do need to keep an eye out for and it can be quite sensitive. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so to you know dynamically select or give the middle end more control about selecting this LML, do you already have plans like how to express or model that in LLVMIR? And how, like how it would interact like with the general types, like the scalable vector types? And... It's just an idea. But... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thanks. yeah, it'd be great to have, but um, yeah, I haven't put any thought into this. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like we estimate oh, register yeah. pressure for interleaving, I believe. This was just from like a quick scan I did the other day. So I guess there is probably already is some support for that that we could reuse, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was just about how it would be modeled in LLVMIR, not how to pick a specific you yeah. know, optimal thing. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, it's kind of hairy. The way that we do set LML for the loop vectorizer is that I think there's like a target transform info hook for the size of vector register in bits. And I, we kind of abuse it by just multiplying the, like what, whatever the minimum vector register size is by whatever our LML factor is. And that kind of tricks the loop vectorizer into emitting these like quote unquote illegal scalable vector types, which then just end up being emitted with a larger vector register. But yeah. So the, the backend already has to do a lot of work to materialize constants and rematerialize them, which is at some level kind of equivalent to what the, has to happen for the VSET VLI instruction. I was wondering if you thought about modeling it as an independent pseudo that was kind of like uh, materializing a constant and just relying on the, the existing framework to, to handle it for you. Or yeah. Did you see a, do you see a big reason to have a custom pass, I guess is my point. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I know um, some other people have been working a lot on constant materialization. Um, Philip's probably a very good guy to ask about that. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's an interesting question about the pseudos. Like, by that, do you kind of mean like having pseudos for specific types of constants that we want to materialize, like specific patterns, or? Yeah, or I mean, you could kind of treat the 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 VLI register as a separate kind of register that just has its own way of materializing, in own instruction for materializing constants. Right? Yeah, well, uh, what I think is interesting is that we've had um, some a bit of a battle in trying to, well, whenever we're improving constant materialization, a lot of what we do is that we try to detect specific patterns. So like one of the big ones is like if you have a step vector, um, like a sequence of like one, two, three, four, right? That's a really common pattern. Like a lot of the time we can improve constant materialization by catching all these cases. But there's a bit of a conflict between fixed length vectors and scalable length vectors where every constant vector that's fixed length is always expressed as a build vector. Um, but we have 
scalable vector intrinsics that represent concepts like a step vector explicitly, like there is an intrinsic to say, give me a constant step vector that's scalable. Um, but with this scalable kind of represent, or with the specific representation of an intrinsic for the step vector type, it's a lot easier to detect. And I don't know if that's maybe like along the similar kind of train of thought as what you're thinking with introducing specific pseudos for these constants, but yeah, it is an idea. Sorry guys, I have to interrupt you. We ran out of time, so we need to prepare for another, for another talk. If you have questions, you can ask them offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luke.